This is Promisa, a game where you walk through the fleeting moments of a grandfather while he talks to his grandchild. As you drift through these crispy PS1 textured worlds, within minutes you get a sense of this man, as his memories have been eroded by the passage of time, with some moments basking in the noonday sun, while others fade into formless shapes, glimpses of their former glory. In a mind overloaded with visions of the past, it's very dreamlike, like those moments before you wake up and a rush of disappointment washes over you when you realise you're not a pirate IRL. It also takes the time to blow my mind with moments like this, where we are looking at a picture that shifts into a place we can fully explore. While it's a subtle play on perspective, like an interactive pop-up book, it blew my mind, I'm not gonna lie and it leans hard into these dreamy visuals, simulating those moments of clarity, those fleeting moments where this fantasy buried deep inside your head feels real. And sure, the written story between the scenes is drier than Dale Winton's sun-bleached bones, but they are here to add to the themes of mournful contemplation, a dissection of a long and lived life, which is both endearing and dread-filled. I mean, if I was this man, would I have this bountiful box of memories? Or would it be filled with nothing but hentai porn and repressed memories of playing Outlast? Of course, I am being hyperbolic, I think. But this first taste begs the question, what is a walking simulator? It's... Uh, it's complicated. But it's a term that can cause a ton of toxic discourse if merely muttered. And trying to detach that shit to get to the core of this surprisingly girthy genre has added a few madness points to my already bloated mind bank. And you can blame the Quantic Dream Games for that. You see, this name for a collection of interactive media is now more a meme than an accurate descriptor of a certain genre of games. And, like most memes, they are annoying and about as funny as a David Cage joke. However, if we are running with this term with this clickbaity title and all, what defines this genre of games where you may or may not walk through it? The common elements of a walking sim share the same loops as a traditional adventure game, which is an emphasis moving through a space being driven by a narrative, either said or shown, as well as exploration, puzzle solving, and or anything that funnels into these two main components, while keeping the usual action-oriented gameplay contrivances like violence to an absolute minimum. But saying that isn't scratching the walls with this near bottomless well. For a genre that's name is used to define it as well as dunk on it, there is more to this niche. And in this video, I want to explore what these games have to offer and play some that may or may not be a walk sim, but uses elements of the genre to convey its world. So don't worry, this is not going to be a video saying Half-Life is a fucking arena shooter or some other shit. But like Senua from Hellblade, the more I looked, the more unseen patterns emerged. So instead of trying to work out what is and what isn't a walking simulator, for now, shall we go for another stroll? While only considered to be the ground zero of the perversion of hardcore gaming, Dear Esther was the beginning of this supposed downturn. If you can count a experiment in narrative storytelling in interactive media, a low point. Deemed pretentious by most online denizens of the time, because people love using big words to define their shallow critiques, Dear Esther came out of seemingly nowhere, and was unique for telling a story that was distant from the player and covering subject matter that wasn't sweet jingoistic nothings whispered into your ear, like an audiobook voiced by Steve Blum. So to boil it down, Esther can be described as an interactive poem reading, where the player turns the invisible pages by walking through this beautiful world, while Jessica Curry tugs at your soul with her melancholic symphonies, and Nigel Carrington tickles your cochlea. When someone had died or was dying, or was so ill they gave up what little hope they could sacrifice, they cut parallel lines into the cliff, exposing the white chalk beneath. You could see them from the mainland or the fishing boats, and know to send aid or impose a cordon of protection, and wait a generation until 
Whatever pestilence stalked the cliff paths died along with its hosts. My lines are just for this, to keep any would-be rescuers at bay. Even though this was made by a tiny team from Brighton, with a name that makes it sound like a tacky strip club, Dear Esther is a game that tries to pull you away from the gore and senseless violence that most games relied on, to give you this small pocket of reality that wants you to sit down, shut up and enjoy it for what it is. And yes, it's fully leaning into the artistic side of this artistic medium, but goddamn, there is something about this world that brings me back to these rocky beaches, time and time again. I've put this on in times where my mind would race, and within a few minutes of play, my head is clear. And sure, you can try and work out what it all means, what the words say and the intent behind the text. Personally, I don't need to know. I like my personal take, and that's all that matters to me. And no, this poem is not about David Cage in a tanuki suit. Dear Esther is a game that gently disarms the player, to push them to explore this island to drink up the atmosphere and let you engage with it however you want, while we could argue the substance of its content and its refusal to go with the common consensus of game design. As a piece of interactive entertainment, it's an island onto its own, whose echo can still be heard over a decade later. After the launch of this game, the developers, the Chinese room, wouldn't rest on their laurels. Post this poetic piss, they made a sequel to the interactive laxative Amnesia called A Metaphor for Pigs, which... Uh, ha, ha. Let's just say it took what made the original unique and did the opposite of what made it unique. In less words, it fucking sucked. Anyway, unperturbed, they released a hot new plate of interactive narrative, released at first exclusively on the PlayStation 4, then later on PC, called Everybody's Gone to the Rapture. The presentation is absolutely beautiful, and gives off that Model Village vibe, like it's the missing four film in the Cornetto trilogy. The hodgepodge of accents of the villagers, or the sparkly versions of them, gives off this feeling of nostalgia. Terry called this morning. Said there was a problem with Harvey. Said he couldn't get through to the vet, so I said I'd come round and take a look. There's a lot of dead birds today. More here, too, poor little things. I've been trying to get hold of Steve, and he always knows what to do. Got round here, and no sign of either of them. With any luck, the stupid creature will have run under a car. It's probably rabies. And a returning Jessica Curry on the OST brings a level of gravitas to the proceedings, even though it can come across like listening to Mozart while taking a shit. And the story, while having the subtlety of a foghorn, flows smoothly from one subject to another. But the main problem is, that story is so fucking boring. Now, it takes a certain amount of stones to put your main narrative crutch on the front of the box, and the Brighton Room attempts to give this blunt story some spice, such as treating the rapture like a virus, and witnessing the social fallout of these bumpkins trying to contain it or trying to flee. But my main gripe with rapture is its penchant for stretching its runtime, to regale us with other stories that read like B-plots in an early afternoon soap opera. Like this isn't Laura Palmer wrapped in plastic, or a quirky lead character with charm and charisma coming to this weird place to work out what the fuck is going on. And more, Gertrude complaining that her pink wafers have gone stale, and if she doesn't pop down to the Safeway before church, the ladies at the knitting club will be disappointed. Yes, this mundanity is an attempt to ground this world, but when I'm listening to an old lady getting pissy about her son, or a love triangle between a plank of wood, the lead character which we'll get to in a second, and the local ex-girlfriend who is also a plank of wood, the question that pops into my head, like a penis for a confession booth, is what does this have to do with what is going on? Does this push the story forward? Or does it add anything interesting to the already established plot point? And I know, I'm making rhetorical questions here, but for me who just played it, no. So I'm confused as to why we have to endure what feels like days listening to the Darling Buds of Mumblecore. For a payoff, we already fucking know. And the undercooked nature just continues, such as the characters, while charming, are mostly chaff, made only noticeable through their Amdram acting. And the only other character that's given any worthwhile development is fundamentally unlikable. The main driving force of this story, a woman called Kate, is a scientist working at the local observatory. And to cut to the chase, she is the one who discovered this anomaly, which started to make the locals disappear. 
and in her hubris, she decides to try and communicate with this thing. And throughout the game, we hear these conversations via blasts of techno babble that will make Gene Rottenberry cringe. And sure, it's an attempt to build the intrigue through sci-fi jargon and make you question if this thing is biblical or something sinister or even fantastical. But what makes her in particular irritating as a lead character is her constant repetitive use of snark. And while this archetype is cliche now, her level of Rick Sanchez puts Sheldon Cooper to shame. And it sucks that the writing of her character has to enforce her intelligence by treating everyone else with its condescending disdain. Hello, Catherine. Elizabeth? Lizzie. I've heard a lot about you. It's good, you know, you and Emma, it's not difficult or anything. Should it be? I'm sorry? You said it wasn't difficult. I don't see why it would be difficult. You and Stephen were together a long time ago. He moved away. It certainly isn't difficult for me. I I'm sorry. I didn't mean to offend you or... Well, I'm not offended. Listen, Elizabeth, I... But Lizzie, please. <laughs> Lizzie. Right. You seem like an okay type of person. And I'm not trying to be rude, I promise. But let's try and be realistic here, huh? Let's, um, try and do our best. It's a British thing, right? Yeah, yeah, I suppose it is. We'll do our best then. And also, she's American. So not only is she rude, the villagers treat her like the love child of Alex Jones and Donald Trump. Once again, I can excuse the pitfalls of game development, especially in the indies, and I can imagine the fucking nightmare of developing this game, especially with an engine that is anecdotally a bitch to master. I can't help but feel disappointed with Rapture. It seems to be more interested in setting up its sumptuous worlds and cranking the OST into Eclipse than giving you a reason to care. Which is ironic when their original game was maligned for its apparent shallowness and its emphasis on presentation over gameplay. And then you get this pretty yet dull fucking game that resembles an episode of Coronation Street that's been slowed and reverbed. It does try to crowbar a message at the very end of the story, but honestly it felt like a last minute addition, rather than a threaded needle tying everything together. And one of the worst things I had while playing Rapture is this feeling that I was skating on top of the world, rather than being thrown into its deep end. And no matter how pretty or vibey it gets, the story just chugs along without a hook to pull me in. With that said, I'm glad I finally finished it, because I've tried playing this throughout the years, but this lack of agency in telling a story that did not slide off my brain, like Jake Paul covered in lube, was holding me back, and honestly, it's still kind of holding me back now. Also, it's getting a bit too Jesus-y in here. What we need is the devil to balance this shit out, so let us leave this village and hail the Dark One. Now this is more my speed. Red Tape is a satirical story on the favourite hangout spot of Greek philosophers. But this version of HE Double Hockey Sticks is not all pitchforks up the arse, or being forced to listen to Westlife for all eternity. No, instead you play as a fallen angel, which I named appropriately, who is tossed out of heaven and is now being forced to intern at Hellcourt. Unhappy with your new career, you decide to be a satanic Karen and complain to the big guy downstairs. However, Satan hasn't been out of his office for a while, and the only way to get to him is to do the bitch jobs of his generals. Think Painkiller. Hmm. <sighs> oh, sorry, I was thinking of Painkiller. Anyway, these bitch jobs are basically fetch quests, but instead of the usual donors of this style of gameplay, the shit you do here is entirely the joke, such as helping Cupid retrieve his bow to settle an argument with his supervisors, or jumping around answering the telephones in the customer service department. Oh, hey Jerry, 
to mending a rift between the cafeteria's head chef and the bemused livestock, who are being forced to cut off their regenerating limbs to feed the workforce. And loads more tongue-in-cheek moments that made me grin like an idiot with a Dyson on my dick. Add the woozy Muzak and the deviant art shit post art style, and red tape is an absolute delight. Also, the final act, which I don't want to spoil, is buck fucking wild, and just talking about it makes me want to play it again. So in a way, red tape is devilishly addictive. <laughs> really? Really? I'm the one who memes. Do you want to know what the true meaning of hell is? The hell when your toilet doesn't flush, and the Wi-Fi is cut off because your government hates you but loves your money. And yes, this is a tenuous link, but Infra gives you the erotic thrill of being one of those dicks wearing a high-vis jacket while holding that mysterious stick. I mean, what do they do with that thing? That thick rod of notches and patterns that teems with wonder and excitement and... Oh, oh. Is it hot in here, or is it just me? Oh, no, 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 no. I'm stuck in a sauna because this is the most Scandinavian game of all time. Infra is an exploration slash puzzle game where we crawl through Finland's utility cupboards, taking pictures of knackered equipment while riding every dodgy elevator known to man. You play as Mark. Oh, hi, Mark. A structural engineer going through his normal day, but he quickly discovers a grand conspiracy that could destroy the country's infrastructure. My name is Alex Hartman. I was just betrayed by the man who practically built this whole city. It started with Bergman, then Stahlberg Steel, and now my company, all bankrupted by Jeff Walter. He bought the companies for next to nothing and then ran them straight into the ground. But that's the least of my problems. With the company out of business, there's no way we can keep everything in good repair. Things are breaking down all over the city, but no one's doing anything about it. The police, the mayor, and now it seems like even the governor's in his pocket. They care more about his money than what he's doing to this place. Whatever he's planning, it's going to happen. And I don't want to be here when it does. Because there's one thing I'm sure of. Everything's about to fall apart. <laughs> I love this. It feels like it was written by a bored structural engineer after playing the entire Metal Gear saga. And the Passion Project vibes are all over this thing. I mean, most of the puzzles demand a doctorate in electrical engineering, and you need passion to achieve that. Look at this switchboard. If you understand this, then you are far more enlightened than me. But goddamn, these environments are nice. And I love the clash between the unforgiving man-made infrastructure being taken over by nature. The greenery poking through the uncaring, unfeeling, utilitarian monstrosities. It's got that source engine feel, which is good because it was made in source. Redundant light is redundant, but if you have played Half-Life 2, you know what I mean. It's got that City 17 brutalistic sterile vibe, but unlike Half-Life 2, Infra doesn't have the locals trying to suck your brains out. And when the game lets you off the leash to urban explore your little tingle off, it was cool finding these little pockets of humanity in this wasteland of electrical boxes and water pipes. This whole world, while empty, feels lived in, and reading bitchy squibbles from the previous inhabitants about their workmates feels comfy in a weirdly toxic way. And also I love that the pause screen is your phone, but the puzzles are the things that held me up. And yeah, sure, it might be because of my ape brain. I'm not very good with puzzle games. But some of these fuckers are so poorly hinted, I felt like a blind rat in a maze. And then this frustration boils over when you watch a guide on YouTube and you realize that you already have solved this riddle, but not in the way the game intended. And honestly, this is where I almost dropped it. Because it's frustrating enough to have puzzles that don't give you any hints as to how to solve them. But when the tracking of these puzzles and how they click together doesn't seem to work, that almost banished Infra to the Shadow Realm, my Steam library. But then it just clicks. I don't know what happened exactly, 
but somehow my brain just snapped on and nearly all the puzzles from around the halfway points just flowed. Yeah, there were a few that still held me up, but nowhere near as bad as at the start of the game. Perhaps this is due to the game coming out piecemeal over a span of a few years, and the devs getting feedback, I'm not entirely sure. But what I know is that the halfway point takes quite a while. And while this is a passion project and I do fuck with that, the length and pacing of Infra may have suffered. 20 hours of what is basically an even nerdier version of Myst is too long in my opinion. Especially when you think the game is getting somewhere to hit a crescendo for it to keep on going. Like a run-on sentence that never cocking ends. Plus there are sections of this game that are so sloppily put together. Such as this moment when you're riding a raft and you have to move from side to side in order to steer it. But if it slightly brushes against the sides, it all just falls apart like my ego on upload day. Or this section where you have to jump from other platforms with the jump controls being stiff as ambered shit. With that said, I respect it for going in directions it shouldn't go, gameplay wise, but the momentary frustration caused by these hastily crafted bits cheapens the deal rather than sweetens it. In my opinion, they could have trimmed 50% of this game out and it would have made for a more impactful title. But when you move away from this roughness, there is a quality game here, and the story, while thin, crescendos in such a way made me fall in love with it regardless of its new numerous flaws, and if it wasn't for my lovely girlfriend giving me this for Christmas, I would never have played it, and Infra deserves to be played. Its emphasis on exploration was a constant stream of good brain chemicals, and the story goes off so many rails, it would make Hideo Kojima look rational. So yeah, shine on Infra, you mad bastard. So, how about that Bloober team, huh? I hear that they're doing something to our boy Sunday. That many neckbeards flock to my silly video on their work to use as a coping ground. And I swear I'm not bitter. And yeah, that rumour months before it was made official that Silent Hill 2 was getting a remake by Bloober Team, it did indeed spark my interest to make that video covering their games. However, there is one particular line that sparked this video you are currently watching which has haunted me. Also, I hate walking simulators, and lo and behold, Bloober excels at plodding around like a fat drunk bastard. Yeah, I don't know why I said that. I mean, sure, they weren't my preferred game style back then, but hate walking simulators? No, that's stupid. While I don't have any idea why I said that shit, what I do know is that Bloober has a new demo out for their remake, remaster, revisionism, revolving door, um, sequel to their magnum opus. And I don't mean Blair Witch. Now, a remake is telling us plebs who buy this shite that the creators have grown since their meager beginnings. And now they are here to state their claim on this newfound confidence and show us how they would improve and evolve their previous work. However, after playing this first taste, it left me confused as to what Layers of Fear 2023 is. Previously known as Layers of Fears, because branding was fucking drunk that day. Anyway, it seemed like Layers 23 was going to be an anthology of its greatest hits. But in actuality, it's both games and their DLCs, plus a brand new chapter, all clumped together in a Frankenstein's monster of a game, which is rendered lovingly in the brand spanking new Unreal Engine 5. So instead of trimming the turd, i.e. Layers 2, we now get another helping of creamy shite in a bigger, better looking bowl. And I have a question, how do you say less is more in Polish? While Bloober and a team doing this remake, and Shah Studios, are trying in earnest to make these games more coherent, both stylistically and story-wise, I'm not gonna lie, but I like that they were individual in their respective looks and feels. Granted this is due to Bloober learning as they went on, which I feel has a certain charm, they still feel like an anthology of ideas. But now, with this new shiny engine, we have more nautical nods than a sailor's asshole. And I swear they're my Sonic the Hedgehog, as they constantly make games that capture my imagination, yet the finished product falls on more swords than fucking Damocles. And to harp back onto what I was just saying, Layers 1 had this goofy ghost train feel that tried to spook the player with fun and creative scares, and the story, even with its rough edges, had a bite to it that made me go, oh Bloober, that's adorable. But now they have a point to prove, so they've gone full serious mode with this remix, and it just kills that playful nature of the original, and replaces it with talking, lots and lots and lots 
of talking. Ass up today. I'm resigning from work at this house. I think I don't have to explain reasons. You know how life in this house looks. If I could give you some advice, think about being more understanding and a bit nicer to future servants. I'm done. I'll do it myself. Keeping the house from breaking apart can't be that hard. Why can't you understand? I'm working in here! I swear, if I'm interrupted one more time... I thought it would be harder. It should be harder. Bones shouldn't break so easily. Which, in a 25 minute long demo, fills me with dread, but not in the intended way. And in this small section where we play Whacker Wife while grabbing cogs to open the door, isn't what I call an evolution of this style of game. In fact, this gameplay wrinkle makes it look worse. And while I've memed on Layers 1 for its goofiness in the past, there was a special kind of atmosphere that it had. Budget be damned, Layers 1 was a game that I respect. And when I mock it for having spooky vegetables, I'm clowning on it like you would your own siblings. It's just fun to take the piss out of it, but I do respect it nonetheless. And now we have this new pretty looking game co-opting the tropes of today, but is about as soulful as this free horror font that's on the finely textured walls. And yes, this is all my impressions from a demo, but it fills me with worry that they took what made the original unique and sanded down those rough edges under the guise of progress, but it was those rough edges that made me love the game in the first place. This is Flower, a joint developed by that video game company, and I hate their name already. Flower is a quirky title where you play as a single petal that soon turns into a zerg rush of flowers, turning this dull, muted land into a blast of vivid colours. And Flower was also the start of Sony's push to bring more artsy games to the much maligned PlayStation Triple, which was at the time dominated by the dudes of Dubro bullshit and Onichimbara, which as we all know is the greatest series of all time. So, what about Flower? Well, it's essentially a puzzle game, and in this PC version has the touchiest controls aside of the Xbox Kinect. In its original release, it took full advantage of the six-axis motion controls, but here it lacks that level of granular movement, making playing the game a fucking slog. But that presentation is... well, yeah. It's got that PS3 arthouse aesthetic down to a T, whatever the fuck that means. And I like it, wonky controls and all. And yes, yes, there is a commentary about the darkness of man, with their filthy technology killing the beauty of nature and all that shite. But this game is a bridge to talk about their sandy follow-up. Coming out one month after Dear Esther, this is the one-two punch that kicked off what we now know as the walking simulator. And uh, it's another game I talked shit about in the past, this time in Stoke Matty's 10 second review series. Journey is a calming, serene sand -em up where you walk towards a mountain and learn a story of an ancient race of cloaked sand people. It's pretty and pretentious and now out on the PC. It's a great game for people who class art galleries as a sexual experience, and hipsters who think good looking games outweigh games with actual fucking gameplay. Well, tell that neck bearded tosser who probably works at Kentaku, no. While the visuals may be striking and stir the soul, a two hour non replayable experience for a price of a cinema ticket ain't my idea of fun, Jim. Plus, get a shave, you scruffy c. Once again, I have no idea where that came from, but I'm going to cut my edgy friend off of the dick here and say that I've always liked this game, even back then. I just didn't want to admit it for some reason. Why? Fuck knows. But the vibes here are sublime, and it's crazy that this was on the PlayStation 3. Sure, I'm now playing the PC port in 4K, but it's a perfect example of art style over graphical grunt. And what makes it so striking is its simplicity. It's easy to read, and there's an alluring purity to that design. In a way, Journey is a perfect companion to its poetic brethren. 
as the story is told without words, yet structured in a similar way, with both having the same element of travelling towards a towering metaphor, with a soundtrack that stirs the sense of intrigue and melancholy. Where Journey branches from Dear Esther is its playful nature, but surprisingly the gameplay. For a genre that gets trolled for its slow, laborious traversal, Journey is an absolute delight to play, with movement which could rival some of the biggest games that demand this type of movement. There is a satisfying weight to your character, with every jump feeling earned and punchy, and the way you SSX tricky over the dunes is genuinely thrilling. Another welcome addition is the game's constant evolving of its environments. As a visual story, you can feel our avatar is going through hell to resurrect their dying race. And overall, there is an earnest charm here that fully knows what it is. Is it pretentious? No. Is it an artsy screed pushing what we could do with video games? Yes. And is it for everyone? Fuck no. And sure, it may have taken me a while to fully embrace it, but Journey is indeed a journey. And that's the hackiest thing I've ever said. But just like Flower, this is another bridge to another game that combines both of these in an explosion of creativity. And that game is called Abzu. Made by the core team that brought you Flower and Steve Austin's Serene Sand Adventure, Abzu is basically Journey but underwater. And honestly, I don't want to talk about it because I want to keep this gem all to myself. But with over 750,000 sales on Steam alone, that feeling is kind of fucking dumb. So what is the secret source that evokes this feeling within me? It's not the story or the message, which like Flower, is that commentary on man and coaching on nature, which makes my eyes roll like a fucking fruit machine. It's not the mechanic where you have to slap an action button to swim faster, because when I'm chilling, I'm not thinking of carpal tunnel syndrome. And it's not the bits where you have to flip a switch on a couple of things to open a door. So what is it? Well, um, this might be the first game I've ever reviewed where I'm stumped as to why I love it so much. Okay, I'm just blue balling you for sport now. Abzu is the combination of flower, journey, and the swimming bits from classic Tomb Raider, all compressed together to form this rush of catharsis. The way you zoom past things collecting fish, just like the Zerg rushes in Flower. The grandiose presentation of Journey, making these small areas you dog paddle through feel huge in scope and scale. And the pacing of the story resets itself regularly to keep things fresh. And it all just comes together in this beautiful cacophony of delight and wonder, with more colours on screen than a Dulux paint advert. It's so good, in fact, I feel like I should be doing a David Attenborough impression. And no, I'm not doing. <laughs> I'm not going to do an impression of David Attenborough. No, that's just stupid. The majestic whale, the bear of the ocean, with sleek, refined scales and large, trusting eyes. This nobleman of the sea guides our player to his destination without the need for words. It's truly extraordinary. <laughs> but I can't help falling in love with... So, what is it that draws me to these experiences? Mostly, it's the exploration. Perhaps I'm just a nosy fucker, but I seem to enjoy gallivanting around a crafted world. From the mundane to the fantastical, if you give me the opportunity to skulk around like a pervert with his hand in your underwear drawer, then I seem to be a happy boy. It's probably best not to read into that. And perhaps it's from my days of playing survival horror games as a kid where the main loop was checking out sizable abodes to find items, solve puzzles, and of course turn the undead into burger meat. And sometimes I would get annoyed because all I really wanted to do was explore this place. So you can tell why I was confused by my own outbursts. Perhaps I was just channeling my contrarian contemporaries rather than just saying, yes, this genre is not for everyone, but goddamn, this is my jam. But it really doesn't matter. This notion of exploration ties in perfectly with our next game.
Gone Home is like someone read that previous mosh pit of words and then made a game built for me. Anyway, you play as Kate, returning home from a trip abroad to find her family have buggered off, leaving only their stuff and other random bollocks just thrown around the place. So like a snitch, she starts to peek into everything to work out where her fam is. And during this investigation, she comes across private notes and scribbles from her younger sister, who is quickly developing a close gal pal relationship with a fellow schoolmate. During my time with this game, I was having fun, looking at how Kate's sister, who started off as a tad plain, became this punk chick who traded cassettes with her burgeoning love. And going through her journals, we see her tastes are being formulated by this new influence. And how this harked back to a time for me recently, when my sister passed away late last year, and we were sorting through her stuff when clearing out her house. And for someone who was incredibly formative in my tastes, it was kind of cool to see a side of her that I never saw. Working out the mystery here and gone home brought back those sad yet insightful memories. However, it felt cozy as well, like a nostalgic reference. And by Kurt Cobain's catch and rag, this game is obsessed with the 90s. Sure, the events unfolded here take place in 1995, but these nods to enforce this era are a tad extra. So extra, in fact, I was expecting a jump scare where Kevin Smith jumped out of a hamper to pelt me with Nirvana CDs and Road Rash cartridges. Well, let's pull off the mask here and say I would prefer that than watch Clerks 3 again, because as we know by now, sometimes dead is better. But I do appreciate that Kate's sister is thirsting over Gillian Anderson, and that is very relatable. And these voice logs that cap off the chapters of this game, you hear the conflicting emotions when she realizes that this relationship is more than just plutonic. Lonnie came over today, but everything was different. She was sitting at my desk chair, and she wouldn't look at me. Finally, I asked her what was going on. She said she felt like she'd done something wrong that night in the city. Like I must think... But I said no. There was nothing wrong. I just wanted to say... But I couldn't find the words. I felt like I was gonna cry, but I wasn't sad. She got up and sat next to me on the bed. I looked at her. Lonnie... Do you think you could ever... And that's when she kissed me. <laughs> and their Riot Girl relationship introduced me to a couple of bands that I've been jamming to since playing this game especially the track Complicated by Heavens to Betsy. Sadly, I can't play it due to the YT Fort Police, but the track is basically the tone of Gone Home in a song, and it's good shit. Sadly, I have to admit that the ending left me a little cold, even though I thought it was going in a certain edgy way, which thankfully it doesn't, but the journey of this love story and why the family disappeared was far more engaging to me, even with this damp squib of a payoff. And I would say Gone Home is a perfect story for you baby gays out there, as I could see this crack in a few eggs. And hell, I had a great time living in this world, and I appreciate its atmosphere. It's a unique one, for sure. But this also raises another question. What is love? And now you have that annoying tune stuck in your head, let's see if the next game will get us all gushy. Now, you're probably looking at this and wondering if I've gone mad. But no, this game is a walking sim, even though it looks like a shitty flash-based MMORPG. Sybil, made by Nina Freeman, who also worked on Gone Home and Tacoma, which is a fantastic game I couldn't fit into this video because, well, look how fucking long it is, is a tale about finding love online and the circus of interacting in a virtual world, but is punctuated by the mundanity of clicking shit to death. And in this fable, we ride along with Nina as she grows an interpersonal relationship with Ichi, aka Blake, 
via a game called Voltimiri. However, the game itself is just a backdrop. Whereas the Observer, we listen to them chit-chatting over VoIP about everything and nothing. I am so not photogenic. You definitely are. I'm not photogenic. I look like a fucking ghost. <laughs> I thought you looked really nice in that photo you posted. You don't have to lie. I'll still like you even if you admit that I look like a ghost. <laughs> no. Yes, come on. Have you seen Guile? He's like a fucking bodybuilder. <laughs> Yeah, I don't know. He's like attractive, but not really my type, you know? I don't know. Dude's got hooks. <laughs> Ew. And what I found novel is the complete desolation of the fourth war. While we as the player are not addressed to outright, the use of real life footage of Nina just doing her thing made me feel like a creepo. But then I was quickly disarmed by the intimacy of these clips and the sensuality of them. Like you're sat there watching her just do her thing like you would a friend. And then being able to click through her computer where you can find snippets of poetry and chat logs with her friends both in the game and out of it. And yes, you can find a few risque snaps, which made me feel uneasy again. But then you realize that you're not here to gaze at Nina. You are Nina. This is not you clicking through her desktop. It's her clicking through her desktop. Which in most games, when you inhabit a character, you don't really think about it. But here it's the intent of the author. Especially when I found in hindsight that this woman is the developer. And sure, I've highlighted the pitfalls of all tier art in the past. But in this example, the story told from the main creative force adds to it in a big way. Sybil feels honest and raw. It's a story that could only be told from someone who lived it. Even the interplay between Nina and Blake feels natural to my ears. Especially Blake, who is a gamer asshole, who speaks in this overtly macho way because he has this inflated feeling of self-worth inside this world. Hey, what's up? Let's just private chat. I'm sick of all these fuckers in the main channel. <laughs> yeah, everyone's pretty rowdy today. They're all spazzing because Bulldog Hell is coming out tonight. They're gonna go line up at whatever store, which fucking sucks because now we can't do anything serious tonight. Sure, Blake talked a big game, in-game, but when that mask is pulled off, you can see a guy who is struggling with what he wants, and Nina growing frustrated over his unease. And if you've ever been in love for the first time, incels cover your ears, this sword fight of interpersonal shaggery will be very relatable to you. And the rapper of this being online just speaks to me. At first I was uneasy about a girl getting half naked in front of me, but once that went away, I found it to be quite engrossing. It's a story from a creator that deeply knows this subject and could only come from a singular creative voice. Sometimes finding love can be weird, your wants and desires can conflict with the wants and desires of other people. And what I find refreshing is that there isn't a good or bad person here. And now how many of you look back at that time and think, yeah, that was fucking dumb. But would you take it back? I know I wouldn't. This is another stretch of the definition of walking simulator, but hey, it's still drawing from that well with its visual storytelling and laid back gameplay. And look, if you use the dynamic collections thing on Steam, it shows that Gree is indeed a walk sim. Granted, the problem with this system is that it's aggregated by its users who are encouraged to tag these games accordingly. Meaning while you get games like Gree and Dear Esther, it also says this. And if this is an example of narrative-driven storytelling, then I'll eat my own smegma. Anywho, Gree, in a nutshell, is Journey, but with a hand-drawn art style. And while it shares the same simple yet striking design, unlike the former, this is more of a personal tale, where you play as a woman spiralling into a deep depression, represented as a fractured monochromatic world, filled with decayed structures. And before I get into my gripes, 
I want to say that playing Gree in a single sitting was gripping and I really enjoyed it. And now I see why quite a few essayists have talked about it, due to its strong stylings and overall message. And while I haven't watched any of these screeds, I will say with my eclectic vocab of penis jokes, Gree is channeling that French shit. And not to invoke that gremlin, because we've took the piss out of him enough, and taking into account that Gree was made by Spaniards, the themes and allegories of this game are not exactly subtle, which is fine in a piece leaning into its presentation to tell its story, and it passes that test with flying colours, but the reason why I said it feels French is because French storytelling is usually emotional but not exactly nuanced, which like I said isn't bad per se, but it left me feeling empty in regards to the subtext and the stuff to chew on post playing the game, and it just comes off as performative rather than a story coming from a personal place. Luckily the gameplay is here to spruce things up, and yeah, it's fine. Stripped to the bare bones, Gree is a basic yet enjoyable puzzle platformer, where you're given different abilities to solve simple tasks. And sure, the start of the game is quite rough, but once you get some fun tools, I quite enjoyed this lo-fi loop. The core of this piece is solid. The main crust, however, doesn't do anything for me. And I'm not saying it's bad or offensive, but depression is a subjective bitch. And the way Gree handles it is fine for a wider audience, but to me it felt like pandering. Sure, we can intuit as to why, those Jess ain't gonna win themselves after all, but as a depression sufferer, what I do to nurture this part of my life doesn't involve consuming sad media. And while the initial need to lay on the floor and cry to raw dog those emotions is valid, it doesn't help me. And I want to reiterate that this is my subjective opinion. And while this example is a triumph in design, the story that it's trying so hard to pull at your heartstrings with feels like misery porn. Not in the sense of being sad for the sake of being sad, no, not that shallow, but it feels like it does pull its punches in some aspects. Like I said, this may be because it's more of a wider spread, wider reaching game than something more personal. I may not completely vibe with it, but if you feel that you need to play it just because you want to, or it may help you distract or cope with how you feel, then do so. I enjoyed my time with it, but the messages I walked away from it didn't really hit me in a way that I thought it would do, so this one's on me. Also, while writing notes for this game, I had this great line that I wanted to use, but I couldn't fit it in this review, so here it is. <clears throat> Gree is the panpipe moods of platformers. Yep, nothing but quality on this fucking channel. I only realised something was wrong <laughs> when I was driving back from school crying and I knew this wasn't right. It was a build up of stress and work and expectations of work and then finding that I, I couldn't do it. Um, I wasn't alone, other people were struggling with it. But I just thought, I can't do this, I can't do this. Why, what's wrong with me? Why can't I do it? I'm a failure. The Longest Journey, created by Alexander Tavert, is a biographical tale based on his father who suffers from depression, and in this interview, being played while we walk across the abstract version of the Tay Road Bridge in Dundee, a known spot for people to commit suicide, we hear his story. Considering this experience is about 10 minutes long, and its story is best experience for yourself, I purposely played this after Gree to contrast how the performative nature of the former can be done in the same artsy way, but told in a more sympathetic manner. And yeah, the way we interpret the text here is far easier to read due to it being essentially a podcast over a picture book, so comparing the two in this manner is unfair. What spurred my need to play this was due to how Gree left me empty in that aspect, and this short trek inspired by Dear Esther hit me hard emotionally. For a game made for his classwork, the longest walk strips away the artifice to give you a glimpse of the human condition, and is a startling reminder that even in our best moments, we still need to look after our fragile bodies and minds. And if I can be more frank, this feels like a more honest depiction, and doesn't need a fucking art degree to say it. I can't do this anymore. What? This. 
What, mornings? In this slice of fried pork, we play as a pig farmer who is tired of working for a criminal underworld and decides to tell his colleague and hitman for the mob that he's done disposing of their bodies. And as you can guess, quitting the mafia leads to a shadow grave, or even worse, an internship at Electronic Arts. And in this brief game, we quickly learn that the relationship between Bricktop and Bret Hart has been a thing for a while, to the point where feeding corpses to mammals is just another Tuesday to them. And throughout this ride, they chat about the pig farmer's life and how it's been falling apart. And you can feel this Jenga tower of guilt that's been weighing him down. And while Brett is trying to comfort his friend, he is also putting him into a proverbial sharpshooter to remind him that this decision is going to lead to him losing the WWF Championship. While the walking in this supposed walking simulator is kept to a bare minimum, Adios is more in line with the games made by Telltale or Bioware, where it plays like a multiple choice questionnaire, which honestly is a gameplay style I've grown to hate due to the choices usually being the same answer said in slightly different ways. Like, oh, shall I tell this guy to fuck off with sincerity or tell him to fuck off like a smug prick? And while Adios has a little bit of this, most of the choices you do make shape the story in a meaningful way, kind of. You only get one ending in this thing, but the interplay between the two characters makes it worthwhile. And I'll take that over the illusion of choice any day. But what I love about Adios is his dark sense of humor. I mean, both of these blokes have done some pretty shitty stuff in their times, and it plays off this really well. But then the writing is so solid, it sort of turns you around to realize that even with these heinous acts, their relationship is genuine, and dare I say, sweet. And while I feel that the overall package suffers from its obvious low budget, what I get here is a solid tale between two people that could have been a great idea for a Kevin Smith movie. But instead, we got Clerks free, which makes me kind of sad. Oh well. What? Got roast pork for lunch. Plenty of taste, British pork. Real value for money. Now come on, Scott. Seriously? What does an art exhibition have to do with walking simulators? And, to be fair, I felt the same way until I actually played it. If you don't know what this is, Kid Amnesia, that's how they spell it, I don't know why, is an interactive visual accompaniment to the titular albums made by Radiohead, where we walk from one exhibit to another and just vibe out. This idea, cooked up by the lead singer, Tom York, and artist Stanley Donwood, was originally a cool way to physically experience these classic records, using the themes from the album art. But after the project stalled due to paperwork and then a global pandemic, they shifted their ideas into the virtual realm. And while it would have been cool to have a real exhibition, I think a digital representation of this album is better, due to its near limitless potential. Sadly, I can't play any clips with music due to the obvious. I will say that I was very late to the Radiohead party. Sure, I liked a few of their tracks growing up, but I didn't get into them until the pandemic, especially when I was looking for more vibey tracks after binging a ton of low roar and churches on daily walks. Also, say you're a fan of Death Stranding without saying Death Stranding. Anyway, I don't remember how I landed on it, but I stumbled into Kid A, so I decided to stick it on. And it blew my fucking mind. And before I knew it, I was a Radiohead, um, head. And while the band was entrenched in the rock scene in the 90s, also creep as a fucking bop, it was Kid A in the year 2000 that put Radiohead from this revered group into a fulcrum point for a ton of new sounds that would later influence other artists that I like. And that's what I love about them. While they made great music, they never stood still and always pushing for a new sound and they were never afraid to alienate their fan base and do their own thing, and I respect the hell out of that. And Kid A is just a fantastic album on its own, and tracks like the slow and spacious build-up of everything in its right place, to the soundtrack to a Guy Ritchie film that never was, in the National Anthem, and to the haunting and heartbreaking contemplation of how to disappear completely, there is a fucking buffet of bangers, and being able to experience them in this way is really cool. In a way, the experience reminds me of those early VR demos, where you would sit on a boat or whatever, while you watch some pretty shit on screen. 
Sure, these things were glorified YouTube videos in 3D, but given the tangibility of VR, it felt real. Sadly, this experience doesn't have a VR component. It would have been cool just to throw on my headset and kill an hour fully immersed in this tiny yet brilliant world. But even in its 2D state, it really hammers home that feeling of exploration and immersiveness you can only get in a game. Sure, your investment may vary if you like the music, but considering it's free on the PS5 and the Epic Game Store, I'd say give it a shot just for the Kid A stuff on its own. And yes, this was a promotion to coincide with the re-release of the album, as well as its follow-up, Amnesia. Oh, oh no. I know I'm supposed to be the stone-faced Chad who plays horror games like it's fucking Mario Kart. Amnesia is an exception, because it scares the cockin' bollocks off me. While this isn't a full review of the game, its influence on what we're talking about here is undeniable. Plus, I'm planning to cover the entire series on its own, when I stop acting like a pussy and finally play them. On a side note, subscribe to my Patreon, and if I hit the milestone of £10 per month, I will drop that video on you like my bowels after 5 minutes of play. And that's the only shameless plug you're getting out of me this year. Amnesia The Dark Descent came out of nowhere in 2010, and while this may sound like hyperbole, it changed the gaming landscape, mostly due to being a horror game where you couldn't fight back, which was novel back then, not so much now, and it's almost immersive sim gameplay where you rifle through drawers and cabinets searching for key items. But fuck that shit. What made me squeal like a Tamworth with its tits in a vice is the cosmic horrors, wanting to shred me into bacon rashes. And yeah, these horrors have been memed to the point of parody now. But these monsters are the punchline to a concrete blanket of dread that slowly pushes your paranoia buttons via the presentation until you alt F4 the fuck out of there. And I've played games that put me on edge, but none have made me quit in panic just because a book fell off a shelf, or when our protagonist Daniel has a mental breakdown due to the fish gods fucking with him. And also being able to bum around his spooky mansion is totally my vibe, even if I can only play in half an hour bursts. And without Amnesia, you wouldn't get other examples like the Trash Fest, Outlast, or hell, that demo made by a big Japanese auteur that every twat with a knowledge of coding copy for the next decade. So, thanks Frictional Games. Now excuse me while I go and change my nap naps. This is Hazmagiri, made by developer Torampo, where we assume the role of a student who, with a friend, decides to go to an abandoned village to find and capture paranormal activities, because, of course. And to no surprise, the girls get grabbed by the ghoulies, and now we have to find our friend and work out why this village is indeed cursed. And I want to pump the brakes here and say, God damn. This game is a vibe. The grimy textures, the fog, the foliage popping in 10 feet in front of you. It's like a cursed PS1 game. And if you had a chip PlayStation back in the day, you may have got this feeling when your mate gave you a burnt disc in the playground and you were introduced to some weirdness like LSD, which, now I mention it, was a proto walk sim, huh? And also the fuel of my nightmares. While the subject at hand isn't as screwy, this little tale has a ton of earnest, atmospheric spooks. And yeah, this isn't amnesia, but I dig its childlike approach to horror. That can also be a nice way of saying that the ghosts are PNGs at half opacity, but I appreciate the amateurishness of the presentation. And it caught me off guard at times. It's very good at showing you something that we know is kind of silly, but within the context of this world, it puts you on edge. My only hang up I have with this is the opposite to the complaint I have with Infra. While that took tens of hours to beat and honestly quite exhausting by the end of it, this can be beaten in tens of minutes. But that's a good thing in my opinion. The replayability is high for me and the multiple endings kept me glued to the screen. And just like Sybil, you can feel the author's intent from start to finish. And what I found fascinating especially was seeing the seams of this work. 
It has a certain honesty in its roughness that really endears me and makes me feel that I could do this. If I wasn't so busy talking about games, I could see myself making a heart-filled jank fest like this. And the best part is that it left me wanting more, which is tough in a medium that wants you to consume and discard. This is Subway Midnight, where you play as a girl as she strolls through a train of weirdness while making friends with ghosts and avoiding the grasp of various monsters trying to chase her down naturally. Straight away you notice the contrast between the dark and gloomy carriages and the bright neon lights of the friendly ghosts. It has a very teenagery vibe, like if Homestuck or Undertale or Yume Nikki had a goth phase while playing Jet Grind Radio. While some may be put off by the Tumblr vomit aesthetic, I found Subway Midnight to be fun, playful in its edgy yet carefree nature, and the presentation takes centre stage here, especially with the emphasis of being a visual story with no talking or words. Which is great, as the game is designed for you to just play it and be one with it, the gameplay itself is the point of contention. With no means of assisting the player in working out the various puzzles, Apart from visually, it usually results into trial and error, which is fine as you're not immensely punished for screwing something up, but the constant started to get on my nerves. At moments such as running away from things you can barely see towards an exit that doesn't look like one was pushing my patience to the point where I almost stopped playing the game. Also the bit in the art gallery where the people are invisible and you have to get through was irritating which of course might be the intent of the creator trying to implant a feeling it just felt cheap to me. And then we get into Colin's game. In this section, we are tasked to find gems to open doors in another attempt to pander to the 32-bit days, as it kind of looks like a game made on one of those PS1 dev kits. And if I'm going to be a dick, it also plays like one. The stiff tank controls, the low range of view, and granted, the only jump scare in this entire game, it's a beat shift in the middle of the game that does do its purpose of breaking up the flow, but I'm not sure if it's needed. I respect it for trying to lean into the horror, but this section can only work once. Just like that PT bit in Resident Evil Village. And while that was a shocking hard right turn, this moment is greatly diminished on repeat playthroughs. And to fully experience everything in Subway, you need to play the game at least twice. So this section, while short, sticks out even more for its brick wall nature. That said, given the flaws and the questionable gameplay choices, you can tell the creator is more driven by the art than the interactivity, and that is endearing. Its creativity is infectious, in a way it runs deeper than the art itself. Games like this with their obvious flaws, or shit that doesn't quite line up to my subjective expectations, makes for a more appealing piece, because I'm given something that I'm not expecting which is also a good thing, and I can't help but respect that. Even though some of the bits were pissing me off, I kept playing the game, and I've played it three times since, so it must be doing something right. This is Stray, also known as, oh, is that game that broke the internet for a while, mostly due to its striking look and, well, being able to play as a fucking cat. Which is a gimmick, yes, but a very entertaining and memeable gimmick. And for its brief time in the spotlight, it was a star that shone bright, perhaps to the detriment of the game itself. We will get to that, but in the meantime, I will admit there is a thrill to experiencing this dystopia through the eyes of this furry gimmick. The sheer agility of movement, the perspective of this tiny creature forced to traverse through this endless sprawl of metal and concrete, and the opening act where you control this anarchic ball of fluff, it's one of those moments that makes me endlessly fascinated with this art form. It's the perfect encapsulation of what a walking sim is and what it could be. 
an experience that doesn't rely on adrenaline filled systems, but allows you to experience its vibe at your own pace. Also, I love this opening because while linear, you get a sense of the size of this world through the scenery being open and airy, which then creates anticipation. And also I love how hands off the game is when you start. You are not blasted with exposition. You're not subjected to lengthy cutscenes that brags about the premise in a way that feels like marketing. It's just you and the road. And the road is fucking gorgeous. The ambience is on point two with the OST evoking a sense of wonder, and the exploration, while railroady, has this forward momentum that is addictive and satisfying, and this design, while simple, makes you feel like you're doing meow, I mean more, than what you are actually doing. And then you are greeted by an adorable little robot that communicates to a cat in a language that it doesn't comprehend, and my love for this little game begins to dampen. Yes, I know that this little bot is a blatant conduit between us, the player, and the world we are being subjected to, but is it necessary? Does bringing in the usual tropes of modern game design help the immersion? In my purview, no. I mean, Stray has been doing a bang up job selling you this place without the need for the usual contrivances, so bringing them back now feels like backpedaling. And then add on top the moments where we are being subjected to long rambling text dumps about a world that our avatar has no concept of because it's a fucking cat. And I'm starting to feel that this main selling point was holding the team back somewhat. And from this moment on, we end up just playing a conventional adventure game. Yes, there are little pockets of greatness weaved in, but the main gameplay loop is taken over by running away and later blasting kawaii headcrabs as the scope of the track we once tittered down with wonder turns into a finely crafted toilet tube, a pipe between towns where we can hang out and chill with the locals before going back into the tunnel. And then we are told to go through a sewer to get to another town and I'm starting to feel like a gerbil going through Bobby Kotick's low intestine. But that gross image actually goes both ways when it comes to the underlying horror taking over this world. But like most things, it's glossed over. Look, I don't hate Stray. In fact, while playing, I was enjoying it, but it does feel like a melting pot of ideas that doesn't quite come together. And the lack of focus on what makes it interesting, to me, is disappointing. That rush of being a cat in a dystopian world felt fresh and exciting. And then it just becomes like every other game, where we play a furry version of a quipping idiot who gets into shenanigans because the attention span of the projected demographic will pass out at the mere hint of a snoozing moggy. Uh, I don't know. I like Stray, but it kind of falls into a pit of mediocrity after the first couple of rapturous hours. It's still a game I'm glad to have played, but its gimmick is just that. It's a game that feels like it's being pulled in different directions creatively, which ends up making it lack a certain punch. It's good, but it could have been great. The impact of Stray when the initial trailer hit in 2020 started a rumble of discontent that this game, where we wander around as a cat, looked like a dreaded walking simulator. Which is kind of odd, considering how many games of this style have come out in a near decade of this genre being given a name. And then fast forward two years, where Stray won the most innovative game on Steam's version of the Game Awards, which, and this is critical, is based on votes by its users of the platform. And once again, these awards mean fucking nothing, and losing your shit over them is pointless. But going back now and scrolling through these endless tweets, decrying that Stray is a walking simulator, and that is bad for some reason, that this alone shouldn't be eligible to win. Which baffles me. Because so what? Why does this being a walk sim stop it from being appreciated? Especially when a lot of poorly punctuated screeds compared Stray to fucking Elden Ring. My middling opinions towards Stray aside, to compare these two is a bad argument that makes no bloody sense. And yeah, I know, trying to holistically review a torrent of pissy online toxicity is a pointless endeavour. But it amazes me how juvenile people can be when a cat game managed to beat Miyazaki in a popularity contest. And then reading endless tweets by random twat bunch of numbers 69 made me kind of salty and maybe want to walk through hell, which is appropriate for our next game. What is she looking at? What is she leaving behind? 
I know what she's thinking. I hear her thoughts. It's not too late to get into the boat and go back. No one will judge her. No one will ever know. Oh, she heard us. There's no going back. You can't do it. Senua pushes away a world that conspired to cause so much suffering. There's nothing to go back to, and worse to look forward to. Hellblade, Senua's Sacrifice, is another title that straddles the genre line, both for its emphasis on being a character study while being a conventional third-person action game. While it doesn't fully fit in either box, this ride-along shares a ton of walk sim traits that could potentially get someone into the genre without even realising it. And I'm gonna bend the fucking theme in this vid around it if it fucking kills me. Developed and published by Ninja Theory, this was a huge roll of the dice for them, as their name was established in the late 2000s, with games like the PS3 launch title, Heavenly Sword, their take on Journey to the West called Enslaved, and their highest profile title to date was 2013's reboot of Devil May Cry, known as DMC Devil May Cry for some confounding reason. And while they took the characters from that edgy and ridiculous series I love dearly, they did some really cool things with it which I would love to explore in another video, and of course made it edgier in the greatest way possible. But after doing some filler work for Marvel and some other mobile projects that just slide off my brain, the ninjas wanted to do something more. So in a rare move, especially for most well-known game devs, their experiment in interactive narratives would be solely on their dime, with a small team. Coined in the game impress as a triple-I game, Hellblade was going to focus on a singular character, on a quest to rescue the soul of her beloved from the clutches of hell. The rub is, our lead, Senua, is afflicted with what the Celts call a curse, but we know with our modern knowledge of medicine as psychosis. And instead of going full Dante and using this mental illness as a springboard for trite contrivance, the team wanted to accurately portray what it's like to live with this condition. So it teamed up with experts and real people who live with it on a day-to-day -day basis to work on this side of her character. And her condition also bleeds into the gameplay. Throughout the story, you'll be tasked to work out puzzles that use her delusions to solve. Such as seeing shapes in the world that mean nothing to us, but to her have a deeper meaning. And this is all wrapped in a constant struggle for clarity going on in Senua's head. Usually I hate it when games don't know when to shut up, but here, in this typhoon of voices, brings this confusing, claustrophobic feel, especially with the use of spatial audio. While ASMR content was quite popular when Hellblade came out, here it's twisted to make you feel trapped. It's a reminder that our lead is suffering without making it into a farce. It's a sympathetic take on mental health, but we are shaken awake from this tangent with the combat, which is basic and, if you're asking me, it dumbs down the experience. It's not offensively bad, but it does feel like it was pushed in there to break up the crushing story. And it does, but from the first fight to the last, there is little progression in terms of the mechanics. All you get is a block, a dodge, a light attack, a heavy attack, and a kick, and that's your lot. And while they try to inject some tension into these encounters by threatening to delete your save data if you die too many times, I have never had this happen to me in the multiple times I've played it throughout the years. But that doesn't matter. This isn't why I enjoy Hellblade. I can look over the action to focus on the story and... <sighs> Fuck. If you ever wanted to get punched in the gut repeatedly for fun, then congrats, you have a new hot favourite. And I don't want to dwell on this too much, because I want this video to be a taster rather than the full course, but that premise I gave you earlier is true, but through the lens of a woman who struggles with lucidity. It's a game that keeps you on your toes, with its personal, intense and soul-crushing story. And to remain on subject, this is a walking simulator at heart, and while it may be a AAA wolf in indie sheep's clothing, it was influential in its own way. And the more I played of Hellblade, the more I saw this in other games, such as God of War 2018, 
a title if I'm going to be honest I have a lot of criticisms about but that opening act where you play as the titular and grumpy anger man Kratos raising his son and cremating his dead wife is using a lot of the immersive techniques that walk sims use to let the player see this world almost like it's just general game design and we've been trying to put it into a certain mold which then maligns it later down the line by other people and plus we've seen this before this supposed aversion towards walking sims is just a reskinned version of another breakout game and its derivatives so let's dial the clock back shall we Doodly doop ba doo 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 doo. Howdy, neighbor. How's the mowing going? Drop dead, Flanders. Yeah, um, I'm looking for Mr. Just Spank Me. First name, Haywood. Ah, uh, Haywood Just Spank Me? Guys, guys, Haywood Just Spank Me! Haywood, <laughs> 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 If I ever catch you, I'll pull your arms off and wear them for a scarf. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Bart, you little scam. Walkins for sissies. My day we wore shoes made of shards of glass. Charties, we call them. Um, no, this isn't right. Mist, a game made by Cyan, is a bridge between the classic point and click adventure game and what we know now as the Humboldt Walking Simulator. Built as a game made for a more mature audience, it started off as a title for the Apple Macintosh, built in its business-centric app called Hypercard, which brought a unique feel to their games due to its single-screen limitations, meaning the art of these single screens took priority, and it lent the brothers who are more artistically minded into making games that were more whimsical, especially with Robin being a composer, a visual artist, and later a film director, and Rand being the coder from his time of being a salary man at his local bank. And I love this, it's very punk in that way. And after a few projects that were praised for their artistic flair, the publisher Sunsoft taps them to make what is now hilariously in hindsight a killer app to the <laughs> media juggernaut and CD-ROM exclusive, The Seventh Guest. Now! Let me go! There's something wrong with her. It's all right, son. You're okay. Don't worry. She... It's just an illusion. An illusion. An illusion. Unlike the usual tropes of the games that were being made for this new format, Mist was going to be an ambient open affair, free from the usual hang-ups like death and fail states, to make it all about you, exploring various worlds with a ton of intricate ciphers to overcome. And it was a smash success, selling over 500,000 copies on the PC and Mac alone in the first year, and then by the year 2000, seven years after it released, it clocked in at a total of 6 million sales. And that's not even including the bundle packs you would get if you, say, bought a new CD drive, or bought the game on the PlayStation, the Sega Saturn, the 3DO, the Atari Jaguar Toilet, CDI, Amiga CD, and so on and so forth. I even bought my mum a copy on the Nintendo 3DS as a gift, and she said, and I quote, it's fucking shite. So now you know where I get this sassy mouth. So you can see this weird game with a reach far stretching its original systems would be very influential and spurned a new generation of developers to took what they played here and spin that off into their own games. What critics would call Miss Clones. And people who were at that point core gamers hated them. And I get it. Sometimes it feels like you're having something shoved down your gullet and that makes you kind of salty. But Myst was an outlier. It transcended the audience of gaming it had at the time. And it wasn't just for the players. It was for everyone. And I think most of us had memories of our parents playing this thing. Like it or not, Myst was a franchise. And it influenced not only just gaming, but culture as a whole. To get to the point, I decided to check out the latest remake of Myst to finally give this game a go. And hey, it looks like something I could sink my teeth into now I'm older. And, you know, understand more of the game mechanics rather than just the... the uh... Uh-huh. Uh-huh. Um... Uh... I... I... Um... Hmm. Um... Hmm. Uh-huh. Uh yeah, to put it simply, Mist is just not for me. <laughs> and while I respect the fuck out of it, 
trying to play it is another story. Even though I don't vibe with it mechanically, that emphasis on exploration and my own curiosity to walk through this world still push me to experience it. And while I tried and fucking failed to pin down the origins of our subject in this video, this need, this desire to experience these bespoke worlds and appreciate them has been boiling inside me for quite some time. And this need hit a fever pitch back when we were all hunkered down during the Panini Panic of 2020. And sure, for the first few weeks, it felt like a national holiday, being able to play Senna and Kagura in my undies while pouring Pringles down my gullet. But then that crushing feeling of emptiness can only be dulled by heart-stopping crispy shit and anime titties for so long. So I decided to go walk around my little part of the world, just to help clear my head and of course improve my health. And with everyone locked indoors, there was this emptiness to the streets, which I found oddly comforting. It was just me and the path I was bumbling down, and I was happy. And this also translated into my gaming habits. I moved away from playing Warframe and other live service shit to games with more interesting biomes. And while these are fake universes, being in a place with these sumptuous visuals made me feel less alone. Cause we didn't know if staying indoors was going to be our new future, and this uncertainty had all of us clutching on these little excuses to escape. That's when I started playing walking simulators, and finally seeing them for what they are, while they're not for everyone, using the immersion that's only available in this medium made these stories hit harder than having the games with all the mechanics. And it was fun to strip away the extrinsic and intrinsic incentives, and just explore these places. Even with some of the bad examples, I got a kick out of these worlds, even if it was just for half an hour. Now you know why I was confused by my outbursts in the Blooper Team video. In my haste to make a snarky video about a studio that I do respect, even though they make crap games for the most part, I slapped down my own love for the genre that I generally adore. And this sounds weird because I'm really only saying this to myself, but I'm sorry. Okay, that's enough of this contemplative bollocks. Let us talk about a game that not only defines this genre, but is easily one of my favorites. Ethan Carter I didn't know, but he knew who I was. When the police won't help you and the priests don't believe you, you call on Paul Prospero. You call on me. If you're a kid like Ethan, you're right. Plenty do. Ethan's letter started out just like any other fan mail. But soon there were mentions of things no little boy should know about. There are places that exist that very few people can see. Ethan could have drawn a map. I hadn't entered Red Creek Valley yet, but already I could feel its darkness reaching out for me. Finding Ethan Carter wasn't going to be as easy as knocking on his door. I was too late for that. To find Ethan, I had to figure out what this place was trying to hide from me. While unassuming from the offset, the vanishing of Ethan Carter is a triumph of not only game design and storytelling, but a bonkers experiment in keeping the player in the palm of its hand to the very end. And while I've kept the stories of these games I've covered in this video obscured for the sake of spoilers, I'm afraid I can't for this one, as its punchline is not only shocking, but just like the rest of the game, is brilliant and thought-provoking. Like the masterpiece Rider Hell Retribution. <laughs> Sorry, I can't be serious when I... <laughs> even when I try. Created by the astronauts who formerly cut their teeth on games like Painkiller and Bulletstorm with their former cabal, People Can Fly. In the early 2000s, after being bought by Epic Games, they left to form an independent studio focusing on story-based games. And Ethan Carter is their first taste of that opening salvo. You inhabit paranormal investigator Paul Prospero, who is on the hunt for the titular character a boy that's gone missing under alleged otherworldly means. One thing you'll notice straight away is this warning at the start of the game, stating that it won't hold your hand. And to some, that was a problem, because you could walk around this place aimlessly for hours. But I found this quite freeing, and I didn't have a problem finding out where to go. However, this being a game where you play as a rent-a-car, this freedom is integral to the investigation. Okay, 
Once you work out what is going on, subsequent playthroughs will render this freedom an illusion, but for that first run, trying to work out the events in this disjointed way adds to the tension for me. And that's the word that defines Ethan Carter. While it's marketed as a horror game, and it does have some spooky moments, it uses tension to push you through its environment. Like this one section when I was walking around and I got jump scared by the fucking pro tag and his gravelly tone. You can feel it, right? Something, uh, something coming from the Vandegrift house. There's also another section in the mines, which leads to some cosmic tentacle fuckery. But then it's chased with other bits where you're running after an astronaut, which leads you to being abducted by aliens, which is juxtaposed to what I was doing a minute ago, which was working out why this bloke ended up in a crypt with a knife in his chest. And now I'm looking at the Great Expanse, contemplating that I'm just a small speck of dust on the Black Mamba dildo of life. Space! Yeah, it's kind of juvenile, which could be considered tonal whiplash. But here, it's by design. This entire story and what I've just said is a misdirect. It wants you to believe that this Midwestern village is under the curse of the sleeper, when actually, this entire story and its wacky tangents are the creative musings of a boy who used his own family members as inspiration for his creativity. And our protagonist, who was tasked to save him, was another figment of his imagination. There is no cult sacrificing villagers to appease a dark god. No witches or ghosts of dead miners. This is all fiction drafted from the mind of a boy, who is being repressed by his overbearing mother, who then took sanctuary in a literal bomb shelter where he could create his own world without judgement. But during an argument, his mother accidentally sets the place on fire, trapping Ethan in the blaze, and knowing his fate, he summons Paul to comfort him in his final moments. While this could have been another edgy display, this moment hammers this sobering feeling of how we can be so cruel to dreamers, who love nothing more than to make art. To forcibly put a lid on creativity will only lead to a bigger eruption later on in life, or even worse, which is a perfect metaphor to the team who made it and for everyone who has been attacked for acting on their imagination. Yes, this is a disquieting ending, but it recontextualizes what we have experienced, which was originally pulpy into something more harder hitting. The vanishing of Ethan Carter is a masterclass in restraint that held my suspension of disbelief to the very end. And then when it drops a real bomb on you, it left me feeling sad for this kid, but in a weird way, also elated. It's a piece that makes me want to make stuff, and no, I don't consider myself an artist, but it gave me the fuel to make this video, and it makes me want to explore more worlds like this. For what it doesn't have in intricate gameplay, it makes up in confidence in its storytelling to push it over the proverbial mountain of its contemporaries. And even if you hate walking sins, I urge you to give this one a go. And I won't judge you for looking up a guide on the portal puzzle. You know what? Art is a hypocritical thing. It takes your subjective tastes and turns them into social constructs. But the fallacy of this divine rod of definition is that tastes can change. The one thing you thought was cool in your youth may not look so hot now, and vice versa, like me and Radiohead. And in this journey, I wanted to play a ton of walk sims that were cluttering up my dumpster fire called a Steam Collection. And the further I explored what makes these games tick, I found a genre that spoke to me more than most games I've ever played. And it's cool to see what would happen if we stripped away the blunt, the banal, to focus on stories and environments within these stories that make you feel conflicting emotions. And yeah, not all attempt to answer all these hefty, lofty questions, and they don't need to. But its emphasis on storytelling, being visual or textual, over everything else fills me with joy. And the teams and solo devs who make these games have made their vision throughout the need to pander to the common consensus. To create is also to compromise, and absolutism to define what is and what isn't a thing makes no sense. So for me to go into this video to search for the absolute was flawed, but that's okay. 
I think Tim Rogers in his review of Tokimeki Memorial puts it succinctly when he realised he wanted to play a game where you do nothing but talk to girls, but you repress this feeling because of perceived public pressures. And this right here is the problem. Not with the short-sightedness of the consumers, but the social ecosystem surrounding the art of this medium. And in my dive into the culture surrounding walk sims, I saw these contradictions between wanting games to be seen as legitimate and this attitude where games had to be quote fun above all else, i.e. be violent and frivolous. And I'm not saying we can't have both, because you can, but excluding one with the potential to push this art form forward because it's perceived to be pretentious or navel gazy makes the normies that look at our preferred time waster as a lesser than than something that could be so much more than itself. To tie a bow on this bullshit, there is more to gaming than just the obvious, and if you're willing to jump the fence, then maybe you might find some things that stick with you. So yeah, I like walking simulators, and now I'm backing away from the microphone. <sighs> Fuck. Oh, and don't forget to play the version of Ethan Carter, it's really good!